Hello everyone, my name is Bradley, and today I'm going to answer quite an important question. One that actually many of us are probably wondering. And that question is, how long will I live? Now of course, I'm going to answer this question with the help of modern technology, which is why I've brought my computer with me today. More importantly, if you actually type into Google, how long will I live, you get a number of different links to a number of different sites. Now, some of these sites promise to determine how long you have left to live with just a couple of words, and others demand that you answer around 50 different questions to get such an answer. But which of these can I actually trust, or are they all lying? Well, to answer this question, I'm actually going to test five different life expectancy calculators online. I'm going to compare the results and also figure out how they work. But more importantly, if they work at all. So let's start with the simplest calculator. You can find it on the website of the Office for National Statistics. Now, this is primarily for the UK. We've got two variables here, age and sex. So let's put 24, calculate 85 years, not bad. And we've got some nice other statistics down here. There's a one in four chance I'll live to 95, one in 10 chance I'll live to 99, and also an 8.5% chance I'll live to 100. So this calculator predicts that I'm gonna live another 59 years, up to 85. It's not bad, but can we really trust it? The method that underpins this prediction first appeared back in the Roman Empire. In the second century AD, Domitius Ulpianus became the head of the Imperial Chancellery. Now, one of the biggest problems he faced here was the collection of inheritance taxes. Now, if an heir received all of the property at once, then it was all pretty simple. A certain percentage was paid from the value of the inheritance. But in some cases, the inheritance couldn't be paid immediately, but rather in monthly payments, much like a pension. To calculate the amount of tax on such inheritance, it was necessary to know in advance how many years the heir would live. So, Ulpianus ordered the collection of statistics on previous payments, and his result was a simple table. If the heir was younger than 20, then on average, this tax had to be paid for 30 years. Those who got their inheritance between the ages of 20 and 24 lived on average two years less, and so on. Of course, this makes sense. The older the heir, the less he or she had to live. But the important thing here is that the relationship isn't exactly direct. That's why it's impossible to use a simple indicator of average life expectancy for the calculation. Infant mortality, for instance, was incredibly high. Therefore, if you look at one average value, the Romans lived for only 21 years on average. But if you reach the age of 15, you could expect to live another 31 years. It turns out that if I'd been born in ancient Rome, I would now be halfway through my life. I would only have 28 years left to live. 33 years less than the 2022 statistic. And by the way, the author of the method himself confirmed the validity of his data. We got a copy of this table from the year 220. At the time, Ulpianus was about 50 years old. Now, according to the table, he should have lived for another nine years. In fact, Ulpianus was murdered by his political opponents at the age of 58. What do you think? Coincidence or fate? But let's return back to the present day. The development of medicine has made it possible to radically reduce child mortality rates. For example, let's deduct 10 years. Wow, so it goes up by one year. Well, let's deduct another 10 years. Let's say I'm four. It goes up another year. Then according to the ONS, he will live three years longer than me. And for a girl, well, she'll reach the age of 90. Now, this difference is largely due to the fact that women monitor their health more closely and are less likely to get into car accidents and also less likely to serve in the army. Now, these factors significantly reduce the risk of a premature death. So, using a method based on a statistical analysis of the country's population looks pretty good. But if you want to compare the life expectancy in your country with that of neighboring countries, then you'll need another tool. Now here, I recommend using data from the United Nations. To compare this data, I use the website interface population.io. And you can see there are a few more variables for input here. So we've got the exact date of birth, so we'll put that in. So I was born on the 6th of February, 
1998. Let's choose the United Kingdom, for instance. I'm a male, click go. Okay, so when I click go and I scroll down, it seems that I have 63.1 years left of life in the United Kingdom. They estimate that I'll live until the age of 87.2 and I will die on the 6th of April, 2085. So this is already three years better than the prediction from the ONS. Let's see what fate would have awaited me if I had been born in some other country. For example, China. So let's first of all put China and we'll click go. Despite the fact that the Celestial Empire is known for the longevity of its people, the expected lifespan has been reduced by a couple of years to 85. What about somewhere like India? Well, let's go back and try India and we'll click go. Wow, okay, so that reduces massively. So that's gone from 87 to 79 years old. So it's clear that country has an impact according to this site. Okay, I wonder if we can get that even lower. Let's try, say, Rwanda. Let's click go. Interesting. Okay, so that's gone even lower. So now it's 75. Much better than in ancient Rome, of course, but as much as eight years younger than in my real homeland. Perhaps this allows me to make quite a reasonable assumption about the quality of healthcare in certain countries. Another person to actually suggest analyzing death statistics was my compatriot, John Graunt. Now he owned a haberdashery shop in 17th century London and spent his spare time engaged in scientific research. In the 17th century, London was absolutely not a place that you would want to have lived. The Great Plague was ravaging the city, for one. And to keep residents informed, each week the mayor's office published data on the number of deceased citizens. Now, this data formed the basis of the first ever statistical study of demographics. Grant collected data on life over an 80-year period and began to look for patterns. As an example, he noticed that more boys are born in London than girls. Grant also calculated that more people die in the city than are born, which was quite curious seeing as the population seemed to grow year after year. He eventually explained this paradox uh, with the fact that migrants from all over the country were actually flocking to the capital. And most importantly, Grant compiled the first ever mortality table, or as it's now named, Grant's life table. The essence of his approach was extremely simple. Grant discovered that out of 100 babies born, on average, only 64 people lived to the age of six. He then divided all of the ages into groups of 10 years and calculated the probability of dying in each group. So, only 40 out of 100 people lived to the age of 16. And if I were in 1662 now, I would have already outlived 75% of Londoners. Pretty scary numbers, right? So in the end, Grant compiled the results of his research into a 90-page book and in it, he describes demographic features of different parts of the capital and also its suburbs. He also analyzed the causes of child mortality and even made predictions about the future changes in the number of residents across the country as a whole. In terms of his life, Grant managed to survive the Great Fire of London and died of jaundice just a few days before his 54th birthday. And according to the table, he managed to outlive about 90% of London residents. It's pretty good, right? Just a couple of years later, the idea of the life table was actually used for commercial purposes for the very first time, to calculate the cost of life insurance. Now, the credit for this idea belongs to Jan de Witt. In those years, he held the position of the Grand Pensionary of the Netherlands. That is, he dealt with foreign policy issues, led parliamentary meetings, and also managed finances. It's a bit like the Prime Minister in today's terms. Now, unfortunately, Jan de Witt is known not for his life, but rather for his death. Together with his brother, he was beaten to death by a drunken crowd. The participants of the brutal massacre began to cut off body parts and, well, fry and eat them. The brother's fingers were cut off and also sold as souvenirs, and the mutilated remains were hung in a crowded square in The Hague. At the time of his death, Jan de Witt was only 46 years old. Clearly, Dutch prime ministers in the 17th century were held responsible for their actions literally by their heads. However, it's not only political opponents who are able to greatly reduce one's lifespan, sometimes we are our own worst enemies. Let's take a look at this next model.
Now, this calculator was created by scientists from the University of Pennsylvania. Unlike previous models, there are already a dozen parameters at play. Now, in addition to gender and age, here you need to specify information about your marital status, your education, your income level, and also frequency of physical exercise. So let's go ahead with it. I'm male, I'm white, 24 years old, I'm about 165 pounds. Uh, I'm just under 5'10", you can't put 5'9 and a half, so let's put 5'10". Um, I'm a college graduate, yes, I am married, currently working. Uh, I earn over $80,000 a year. Um, fitness, I, I'd like the gym to be honest, so I, I probably go three to four times a week. Um, and because of that, I think that I have very good health, let's say that. Um, and I don't have diabetes. Now, alcohol and smoking. To begin with, I'm going to answer truthfully that I don't smoke or drink alcoholic beverages. Mum, I hope you're watching this video. Interesting, so this is the first calculator I've seen that actually takes into account how much you drink and how much you smoke. So let's play around with this a bit. Now, in terms of myself, I'm going to be honest, I have about two to seven drinks per week. I, I like my whiskey. Um, and I've never smoked, which is true. Uh, so let's calculate my life expectancy. It's exciting. Wow, so it says that I'm going to live to 99 years old. That is incredible. This is the highest number we've seen for today. Conclusion, don't smoke and don't drink, right? <laughs> However, I actually violated the first rule of a competent researcher here. I changed two parameters at once, and therefore it's too early to draw conclusions. So let's say that I don't drink at all, zero alcohol, but I smoke, let's say a pack a day, right? Now calculate. Let's see how that changes the estimate. So it was 99 years old. What is it gonna be now? 83. But what happens if we don't smoke, but we drink as much as Tommy Shelby from Peaky Blinders? So let's say I've never smoked, but I drink eight or more drinks a week. Okay, that's more than one drink a day. Calculate. 98. Wow. So if I drink every single day with my current lifestyle, I'll live to 98 years old. I mean, that can't be right, can it? Okay, but an interesting question here is, what if with my current lifestyle, I were to smoke a pack of cigarettes a day and I were to drink, let's say, eight or more uh, drinks a week? So let's say still smoke one pack a day. Wow, so I'll still live to 85 years old if I smoke a pack of cigarettes a day and I drink every day. Wait. That's more than if I didn't drink at all. So effectively, the advice of Blueprint Income is if you're smoking a pack of cigarettes a day, you can increase your life expectancy by drinking. I definitely like this model, but there are clearly a few issues with it. I suspect the problem lies in the very concept of estimated life expectancy. This indicator isn't actually calculated in the most intuitive of ways. In the previous examples, we talked about the processing of statistical data from past periods. For instance, Grant used statistics from 80 years of research, and this is more than the life expectancy of 99.9% .9 of his contemporaries. And by the time the study began, almost all of them were already dead. Perhaps this gave satisfactory results back in the 17th century, but now the healthcare system is changing much faster. And therefore, estimated life expectancy takes a different approach to its calculations. Let's say that we want to find out the life expectancy for those who, like me, were born in 1998. Now, those who study demographics assume that in the future, people will die in the same proportion as they died this year. Therefore, they record how many newborns, one-year-olds, and so on, all died in 98. If I want to find out the probability of death at 90, well, I'd have to check how many 90-year-olds died in the year of my birth. Do you understand the issue here? Medicine is continuously developing, so life expectancy is constantly increasing. Look at these graphs. Do you see how the age of death has shifted to the right over the past 170 years? So the estimated life expectancy usually gives a somewhat understated value. In different models, they try to bring it closer to real life with the help of additional coefficients. But look, 
Why did small doses of alcohol increase the estimated life expectancy? Well, I will assume that in this case, this indicator was calculated separately for people who do not drink alcohol and those who drink up to seven standard doses per week. In 1998, the alcohol-free diet had not yet become fashionable. If a person didn't drink alcohol at all, it was often associated with health problems. Most medications rule out even a small glass of beer, for instance. And therefore, I'd venture a guess that within the statistics of the end of the 20th century, the moderately drinking group was initially somewhat healthier. Not to mention that the occasional glass of wine can do wonders for your stress levels. I'm not sure we should be saying that on YouTube. But anyway, it's curious, but I'm not the first to encounter this kind of unusual data. If you're interested in this topic, type French paradox into your search bar. People have been arguing about it since 1986. So let's test out this theory on another site. Now this resource is based on a model proposed by scientists of the University of Minnesota. To get a final result, you'll have to answer 50 questions. But for my experiment, I'm just gonna use an interesting feature of the site. Look at this scale at the top of the screen. When I answer questions related to nutrition and bad habits, the number of days in my life increases or decreases. This is a great way to check how alcohol affects the calculation. So the answer of zero doses added 80 days to my life but four doses of alcohol a week shortened my life by 40 days. It seems that the guys from Minnesota have a completely different attitude to alcohol. Well, I completed the entire test and I was pretty pleased with the result. Moreover, the creators promised to increase it for another seven years if I followed their recommendations. Not a bad advertising move. Can anyone resist clicking on such a button? However, I'm gonna add this value to our timeline. To be honest, I like the idea of adding days for correct answers. There's something of the good old RPG here. But just how justified are these figures? How do scientists know how many days red meat is adding or say salty snacks are deducting? Well, this is the data that researchers receive within the framework of evidence-based medicine. For many centuries, doctors have treated diseases based on their own experiences. They learned maybe something from mentors and maybe a bit from medical pamphlets. And it's therefore no surprise that in the Middle Ages, healers and surgeons more often mutilated than treated people. But in the middle of the 17th century, a modest ship surgeon made a revolution. On a long voyage on the ship of James Lind, scurvy began to rear its ugly head. The bodies of the sailors were covered with rashes and ulcers, their gums began to bleed and eventually their teeth began to fall out. The situation was desperate and Lind decided on a bold experiment. He divided the six sailors into six groups and began to treat them with, well, whatever was at hand. One group received cider, the other washed down the food with seawater, the third saw drops of vitriol and the fourth vinegar. And the most effective remedy turned out to be fresh fruit. As we already know, scurvy is caused by lack of vitamin C. And in those days, it was easiest to get vitamin C from citrus fruits, right? Which is why sailors were often called limeys, because they were sucking on limes the whole time after this revelation. So after returning from this voyage, Lind shared his results by writing a treatise on scurvy. So there was what we would now call a controlled clinical trial. Lind lived for 77 long years, but never received proper recognition for his work. But now, three centuries later, clinical research forms the foundation of all medicine. The effectiveness of any new medicine or vaccine must be confirmed with the help of such studies. And this is why also the method of comparative tests has been adopted by nutritionists. That's where specific figures tend to come into play. How many beans, nuts, or vegetables can basically change your life expectancy. But is everything really this simple? Unfortunately, it's quite the opposite. Our body is an incredibly complex thing. By interfering with its inner workings, with say medicines, we're upsetting the natural balance. Side effects add up over time and multiply if we use several different drugs. Research is becoming more and more complicated and we're trying to take into account more and more new factors. Data volumes are also rapidly increasing and models are becoming increasingly more complex. Take a look at the website of Dr. Thomas Pearls. What do you think? 
<laughs> Doesn't it look like a relic from the 90s? Well, even if it is, this is the most thoughtful and multifactorial model of the life expectancy calculator. There are questions about hereditary diseases, lifestyle, food preferences. Some of them we actually saw in the previous calculators, but many are unique. For example, the question of whether I fasten my seatbelt when I'm driving. It's quite an important question when you think about it. Right, okay, let's try and go through this quickly. So, married, um, would you have in-person contact with family members or friends? Uh, yeah, I, I think so, yeah. Uh, current stress level, medium. Um, doing all right. Sleep habits, I have very good sleep habits. Uh, I have a postgraduate qualification. Are you optimistic about your aging or pessimistic? I think I'm getting better with age. I think I'm getting more sexy with age, so <laughs> I don't know. Uh, okay, air quality, I think it's average. I live in a city. Um, Pissy bottom, I, I, I don't use my seatbelt in the car. It's very bad. Uh, how many cups of caffeinated coffee do you drink per day? One to two cups. Cups of tea, three to five. Do you smoke? Uh, no. Uh, I don't chew any tobacco. Uh, I don't smoke. I often take aspirin, I never take aspirin. Uh, I never wear um, sunscreen. I live in London. Who does? <laughs> Who does? Uh, do you ever engage in risky sexual unprotected behavior? Is this something I should be telling the audience? What the? I'm married, I am married, and this is a strange question. Of course I do not, never. What does risky mean though? This <laughs> Do you bodybuild or strength train uh, that your BMI is high because of muscle? That's an interesting question. It's a really, really interesting question. Um, I think I strength train, so maybe, but I'm, I'm not that heavy, so. Do you have a bowel movement at least once every two days? This will not, this cannot be in the video. Oh my god! At least once every two days. Yes, I do. I think I'm fairly normal. Do you regularly scream skin? <laughs> no, I don't. Okay, your calculated life expectancy is 87. Not bad. Not the highest that we've seen, but I think 87 is still pretty good. Lots of different questions as well. I like that. I'm pretty happy. 87. Let's go. Okay, so let's summarize the results of this experiment. Firstly, I was surprised by such a small spread of predictions. There's only a six year difference between the minimum and maximum values. In terms of predicting the events of 60 years down the line, this really isn't much of a gap. And it also seems that additional factors, on average, tend to have less effect on the life of a particular person. If I drink too much, get behind the wheel and demolish a red phone booth, right? It will greatly affect my life expectancy, but it will have little effect on future calculations. And finally, the big question is, can we trust all of these calculators and applications or services? I want to say yes, but no, we can't. In fact, while these are good tools for visualizing the statistical data, they're not able to predict the life expectancy of an individual. Now, in order for such a forecast to differ from, say, well, fortune telling, we need to combine several new technologies together. Now, information about the individual characteristics of our body's workings can actually be collected using new models of smartphones, let's say fitness bracelets and smartwatches. Until very recently, they were only able to measure your pulse. And now they're able to identify things like heart problems by changing their gait and approximately estimate the oxygen level in the blood. I'm sure that there are many new features waiting for us in the future that we don't even know about yet. The second direction is big data processing. Clinical studies are rapidly accumulating and it's getting increasingly difficult to combine them into meta-analyses. We need new methods of information processing, including those that allow us to work with confidential data without the threat of their disclosure or data leaks, right? And finally, data from portable devices will also be processed in an unusual way. Soon, there will be extensive use of neural networks. So far, they're just learning how to help oncologists and also trying to process individual medical histories. With the growth of computing power, well, they'll come to our smartphones as well. And this has already happened with Siri. So in a couple of years, my iPhone might actually speak with the voice of Dr. House. It's the basic truth of the human condition that everybody lies.
And this will make it possible to make a leap from the average life expectancy data to the calculation of personalized life expectancy, right? A real bespoke process. And in any case, I'm absolutely sure that every year we're going to be living longer and longer thanks to better diets and medical innovations, etc. Well, anyway, my name is Bradley Peak, and thank you for joining me on another jungle adventure. Lastly, I've got a question. To subscribe or not to subscribe? See you in the next video.